friends, and welcome to this week's episode of Brainstorming America. I'm John Merrill, and we're delighted to have you join us again this week. I want to take a minute to introduce my distinguished colleague, Ken Rollins. Ken, tell us what you've got for us this week, okay, my brother. Okay, good to see you, John. Yes, sir. Always good to be with yeah. you. Okay, let's see. I made myself some notes because I work for notes pretty good, especially on that. Um, I, I want to pick your brain a little bit about with the uh, the woke culture. I want to throw one at you. We've never discussed this. What is your thoughts on the woke culture, the liberal? Uh, don't say Mrs. Don't say Mr. I think it's pretty evident that most of those people need to go back to bed. Mm -hmm. uh, they were woke. They woke. But because they they're woke, they're they need awake. to go back to bed because they're not ready for prime time. <laughs> and that's obvious because of the attitudes that they have and the way that they try to interact with people. It's such a negative uh, blight that we have seen introduced at this particular time in our country's history. And I really, I, I was talking to a friend earlier this week about uh, how definitions of words have changed because people have co-opted those words to make them be what they actually wanted them to be as opposed to what the intended definition was when it was recorded in the Merriam-Webster Dictionary. And I, I really cannot understand, Ken, why so many people think that the world started when they entered it or a particular job yeah. began when they took it <laughs> took the employment opportunity mm -hmm. it, it's just amazing to me how conceited some people are and that's what the woke culture is all about to me i had not heard the word conceited put with it but i was just i saw an, an instance where a teacher and i want to say it's california s sent a little nine-year-old boy to the to the, uh, the the room to see the uh, the head of the school principal, and they expelled that kid for calling her Mrs. Wilkinson. He used the word Mrs. She had taught that class. Just because you see someone wearing a dress does not mean that they are a female. So, no, it could mean if they're a guy, they're just messed up in the head. And, and that's the thing that we need to remember is that that kind of behavior and that kind of attitude may be appropriate for that particular individual. And if it is, then stay in your house and dress like that and then walk around, do whatever you want. But don't go to Walmart and don't go to the football game at the local high school and don't go to church that way. What you need to do is you need to realize what kind of impression you're making on other people and what kind of confusion you're actually causing for children and young people who are still trying to form their opinions about life. It's just amazing to me how many people think that their ideas and their thought processes are the only ones that matter. We need to be a little more open. There's no doubt about that. We need to be a little more courteous. We need to be a little kinder. We need to be a little more forgiving. But what we really need to do is to understand that we're not the end all and be all for life. If we were, the Lord would only have created us and then let everybody else go the way of the buffalo. But we need to understand that we're all in this together and we need to act like that and we need to you start working that way. You somebody besides us. <laughs> as hard to believe but, as it is, it's true. But, but with that little boy, I thought about it from a bigger picture was he was thrown out of that class from his friends that he had made. And they had to see that their friend got kicked out for saying misses. So it affects not only him, but his, that other group of people behind him, uh, with him. And uh, to go on to another school, well, why, why are you coming here? I got kicked out for calling the t uh, teacher misses. Well, I know all my teachers was Mrs. Jones or Ms. Hoover or whatever. So, anyhow, some more school stuff while I got you on that. Uh, but the thing is, Ken, we can't get past this. That child that you're talking about that called that teacher Mrs. was taught to do that by his parents to show respect for older people to make sure that they knew that he appreciated the service they were providing and to show that he was someone that acknowledged that and did so to set a positive example for his friends. Absolutely. Uh, on the, what we're talking about, 
schools. Uh, yesterday, it was announced that uh, I, I think in Pennsylvania and two other states, they're talking about doing away with with the honor classes. You may have saw that. I did. Honors and, English is the one I saw. Yeah, and this was like those that are up here. Let's don't get up, get up here because we got a bunch down here still still trying to ha come on up that stayed home during COVID or whatever. But this group up here is excelling. So we got to knock them back down to quality. We got to make sure that one group don't outrun the other. We think. I, I, I think mean, I got. I was idea. embarrassed to read it. Yeah. And and the reason it embarrassed me is because why would you think that it is a good idea to restrict people who are accelerated, people who are brighter, mm -hmm. people who are better looking, people who are uh, more apt to try to make a positive contribution to the community from gaining access to those learning opportunities that they can only get if they are in that accelerated environment. And that is another uh, concern that I have whenever we're talking about restricting individuals because you believe it's for the greater good if everybody is placed at the same level. Well, let me just tell you this. Everybody's not at the same level. Some no. people are smarter. Some people are better looking. Some people do have more money. But what we need to understand is everybody can treat people wisely, courteously, consideration is what we need, but we don't need people to feel like that they are just a part of a bigger class where everybody is the same. And that is happening as we speak. Yep. So uh, they're telling us we got to go to a break, so let's go make some money. We'll be uh, right back after this. Welcome back to Brainstorming in America. We're so excited that you've chosen to join us for this segment of this week's show. And, Ken, we're on a roll, so there's no need to stop now, brother. All right, let's go with something. Uh, your time is up. You, you're no longer the Secretary of State. Just recently up there. What about the new guy is on? I saw a word that was used, and I don't know what it means. Eric. What is that about? So the Electronic Registration Information Center is That's a either. program that the state of Alabama joined in 2016 after legislation was passed by Lieutenant Governor Will Ainsworth, who at the time okay. was in the Alabama legislature, enabling our state to be able to join a consortium of states that allowed us to be able to check voter rolls in Alabama and compare them against other member states to see if people were registered in more than one state at the same time, to see if people were voting in more than one state in the same election cycle, and to see if proper voter roll maintenance was actually being adhered to. Wow. And we felt like it was a great idea. Uh, it was something that had started after another effort had begun in Kansas through the interstate cross-check program, but it did not enable the individuals to be able to uh, gain access to the voter information when that individual had actually participated in the process. And I can tell you that we were able to remove thousands of people from the voter rolls because of the work that we were able to do in cooperation with other member states in ERIC. Now, there's been some misrepresentation about how ERIC started. Uh, there are people who claimed that George Soros, who's a noted liberal activist, uh, had actually given money to the Pew Charitable Trust with the sole intent of creating this particular entity. Uh, there is no valid proof. There is no empirical data. There is no evidence that shows that that ever occurred. Uh, it's only speculation. And since George Soros is a straw man that people like to jump on and say that because he's a part of it, we don't want to be a part of it. Uh, it. It was very interesting to me that that was never proven. Now, George Soros has given money to the Pew Charitable Trust, but you may have as well. Uh, our family may have. Uh, thousands of people all across the world contribute to the Pew Charitable Trust for the good that they do throughout the world. But there has never been an scintilla of evidence that's been introduced that would have shown that George Soros had anything to do with that. Furthermore, there's no evidence that George Soros never had any interaction with any Eric board member or any 
group of board members that was gathered at one time. No communication, no threat of emails, uh, no letters that have been sent asking them to do certain things. So my question on this particular item is this, Ken. If you don't like Eric, the Electronic Registration Information Center, and you think it should be done away with for the state of Alabama, that's fine. You can do that. You have the prerogative to do that as the chief election official for the state of Alabama. But since there's never been a vulnerability exposed, there's never been any irregularity, inconsistency, or impropriety introduced related to Eric or its function, then what are you going to replace Eric with? Because there is nothing out there today that can do the work that Eric does for all those 30 plus member states throughout the union. And Alabama had led the efforts to gain access to voter rolls from Georgia, Tennessee, Florida, Mississippi, Louisiana, all the southern states in order to make sure that those states where most of our people move to and except people from, were able to be able to do that in a way that would help us be better prepared for a successful administration of the election. So that's where we are, and that's what it's all about. The one thing that you said, in Eric, about making the checks and balances to, to make things right, it doesn't seem like Soros would be interested in that kind of work. That would be opposite of what he does. That's you mean he's not interested in doing things the right <laughs> way or to treat exactly, people fairly? That's exactly what I was getting at, yeah. So it doesn't, I would rule him out right quick because if I want to tear something up, you know, I, I'd say uh, I know a lot of people that could tear up a, a Rolex watch, but they couldn't put it back, couldn't could put right. a time back, back together. That's right. So Well, I'll, I'll say this too. Uh, there are other things that the 54th Secretary of State has said that he would like to introduce in order to uh, replace some of the things that Eric has done. And yet all of the things that he has introduced, using Social Security roles, using uh, databases from the Driver's License Division of the Alabama Law Enforcement Agency, using medical records, uh, using court records, all of those things that he suggested that he would like to use, we already have been doing in the office of the Secretary mm -hmm. of State. So I'd like some new information because you are entitled to your own opinion, but you're not entitled to your own facts. Well, it's uh, it's getting up there now. I hope that that the, the new Secretary of State, the, the scrubbing the list that you did, impressed me more than a lot of the stuff you did in the office was every year that list has got to change. We've got a lot of people dying in Alabama. Of course it is. And look, Ken, I, I know it's been well documented and publicized that from January the 19th, 2015 until January the 15th, 2023, during my time as the 53rd Secretary of State, we registered 2,215,229 new voters in the state of Alabama, making a state record 3,702,413 registered voters. But we removed more than 1.5 million people from the voter rolls during that period of time. And voter roll maintenance is the most important part of a where successful voter roll. Where was the suppression at? Uh, that, that's the biggest problem for the liberals. They're trying to find it. Oh, Lord. They're trying to find it, my brother. Oh, man. We got we to gotta, we gotta go out. You want to take us out? Yes, sir, I will. Thank you for continuing to be with us, and we hope that you'll stay with us for the last segment today on Brainstorming America. Welcome back to the final segment of this week's episode of Brainstorming America. Ken, let's wrap this thing up. All right. Well, we got we got, we got a lot of rapping to do here. I got some subjects I'm going to talk about. Things that if we're going to be rapping, I want MJ to be a part yeah, of that. Okay, well, I'm just we saying can't, we can't let him do that. Uh, the subject I'm going to talk about now is uh, something that bothers bothers me. So I'm going to. It's the uh, we're selling our farmland. To the Chinese, we're selling all of our land, not just farmland, but to the Chinese. They own, I forgot what the big number was, but it's like a third of the land in the, in the Midwest is owned by Chinese conglomerates. And so they get, to, they get to take the food harvested from that land, send it wherever they want to send it, and not send it where they want to send it. They control the uh, our food and they they got everything else they 
these uh, cars that they're doing, uh, the electric cars, they're furnishing the, the plating uh, for the batteries. And for the solar system, they are furnishing all those uh, uh, plated, I don't know what you call them, but, uh, but for the solar system. And so we are, we are turning our country over to the Chinese from Ken Rollins' perspective. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I do think it's so very important that we maintain an eye on China and what China's doing. But I don't think we can be in a position where we completely separate ourselves from China. And we just decide we're not going to have any interaction with them at all. Because if that happens, we're actually allowing them to do more than they would be able to do if we cast a watchful eye on them. I think it's very important to maintain a relationship with them at an economic level, at an educational level, at a social level, at a governmental level, in order to make sure that they're not mistreating our people who are trying to do business in China. Obviously, they have the largest market in the world. And for us to think that our goods and services are not going to be able to go to the largest market in the world is actually impeding the people in our state and other states in the Union who may wish to do business with the Chinese. The other thing I think is very important is that there are legislative bodies throughout the 50 states and in Congress that are considering making it illegal for a purchase of property, a purchase of goods, a purchase of services to be illegal whenever you are interacting with China. But that's a very, very, very thin line that we need to make sure that before we begin to stomp on it, let alone cross it, that we know what the ramifications are for our state and the people throughout our state and the United States of America. Other, other than them buying land in Nebraska and place like that for the, for the farming, the part that worried me about it was when they started buying up property uh, out in Montana and places, that's where our nuclear weapons are kept. And to have a Chinese uh, property next to the base, that was the part that... Christy Noam, you know, the uh, sure. governor, uh, she she just put, they got a law passed in South Dakota. You can't do that. So that's somebody else that's just worrying about the same thing I was worried about. They have access to what we're doing and uh, right there in their backyard, so to speak. Look, Ken, our governmental leaders, the, the, the number one purpose that they serve is to make sure that they are protecting the people in each individual jurisdiction that they represent that state and our country as a whole. That's their primary responsibility. If we're not doing that as elected officials, what purpose are we serving? We have to, as the preamble says, number one, provide for the common defense of the United States of America. Yeah. That's number one. Well, I hope that one of the things that comes out of what we're doing here is making people more aware of the in-depth of things that there are problems out there and how they can, if they're talking to their congressman or whatever, uh, but, but one of the things that bothers me a lot is the, it, not necessarily in our cities in Alabama, but where the DA is saying, I won't prosecute uh, anything for under $950. So you could go into the Heflin uh, grocery store up there and steal up to $940 worth of goods and not be prosecuting. That's what they're doing in the big cities. Uh, they're saying, you know, that they can go into to a jeweler's and steal 20000 but you don't get prosecuted. And, and that, that rolls down to where those people end up in Alabama and all that. So it's, Ken, it's when you let people engage in that kind of practice, you know what it means. It means that we're saying we've got an open door for you. Come get what you want. Take what you want. Do with it as you want. If someone's in your way, then it's okay for you to harm them as well. That's a problem that our culture has allowed us to advance to at this particular time, and we've got to do something to stop it. We have outstanding law enforcement officers all throughout the country, but we have some law enforcement officers that are not very strong. Those people need to be pruned. They need to be removed from service. And if we allow 
the law enforcement professionals in those local jurisdictions, in those municipal jurisdictions, in those state jurisdictions to take care of their own through internal investigation options that are going to be presented, then they will do so because they know that it reflects poorly on them as an institution if they don't control their own and do what needs to be done. So I'm very, very supportive of the men and women in blue because they protect us. That's their responsibility. We need to give them all the support that we can so they know that when they go to work each and every day, we're there giving them our back support. And well, you need, the, the law enforcement needs to know that when they put somebody behind bars, they won't do a turnstile and beat them back to the street. Because that's, Absolutely, that's a lot my of friend. A lot of that's happening out there. And uh, let me throw this at you. We're down about a minute and a half, but I want to balloons. What about the balloons? Yes, sir. Uh, they, they make something for those balloons that has not been introduced in every state in the union. But um, uh, there's a number of them that are available in your home. There's some that are available in my home. It's called a 410, and it's called a 22. Uh, it's called yeah. a 357 Magnum. Yeah. And those items are able to help solve the balloon problem yeah. all throughout the nation. Well, they didn't send them over Alabama. Uh, no, <laughs> because it would not have left our jurisdiction. <laughs> and it wouldn't have been, well, no, we wouldn't have used a half million dollar Stinger missile or whatever to take it out either. Uh, no, sir. <laughs> Absolutely not. Well, that was a different answer than I thought I was going to get. Uh, don't know how much time we got left today. Oh, Lord, they said 30 seconds. You leave that. That's just enough for you to tell everybody how good looking you well, are with well, that new haircut. <laughs> well, yeah, y'all like that. That's my great clips. Uh, thank you, great clips. Uh, yeah, we, we'll, uh, we'll be back next, well, I guess next week. Yes, sir. All right, so uh, everybody tune into that. So we, we, we're going down on camera two. That's where we are, right, camera two. We'll see you next time, folks. Thank you.